question is how much uh, computing uh, power can you get for, uh, I mean, lots of people have $35, the Rockefeller stuff, but those guys of us who don't have that kind of money but want a cluster, what are your options? And you start looking at things like, well, that's you start looking at, uh, well, even if you get a Raspberry Pi Zero, you still got to get the SD card. And, and you're talking real money there. You talk about ESP32 dual cores, you can get those for a buck. I've got Raspberry Pi 4 with 2 gigabytes. Yeah. I'm using the Samsung E5 FSD, yeah. which is SP31, but I'm still able to get like 400 uh, minutes a second. Must be nice if you made the money like that. But some of us don't have that kind of money. But no, it's not. So what are the benchmarks looking like out of it? You got the updated firmware to get past them? 200, 300, 400. Wow. At least with that DD. Yeah. I haven't bought any fours yet. I've, I saw uh, Bill Rose starting to have their kits out and stuff like that. And, Nothing a little bit of oil. I just got the, the little passive. Yeah. Well, one, one is uh, we get the ones that are like the tower size. Those yeah, ones are interesting. Uh, so we're gonna record. Are we recording? It's streaming. Yeah. All right, we're streaming. That's good enough. All right. So today we're gonna talk about unikernels. How many of you guys know what a unikernel is or ever played with unikernels? You've all played with unikernels. It's called NS DOS. I have lots of Wikipedia. Ah, sweet. <laughs> it's uh, well, a unikernel. The, the definition kind of is that most people go is a single a single address space program. It combines what we normally think of as a kernel and the libraries and application all into one executable. Uh, so it can usually be run in a hypervisor or it can be run a bare metal. There are a lot of different approaches on it. Uh, they've been, in the past, they were called exokernels, uh, nanokernels. They've had a bunch of different names. Nemesis. Was Nemesis one? Yeah. Nemesis? I don't recall that one. Oh. What, what, how long ago was that? Wikipedia. First oh, two okay. This <laughs> <laughs> I only made it to the first paragraph, so you're, you should be doing this talk now. Maybe. But, what? Uh, I'm going to show that one. But, uh, um, so if anybody's got any questions, comments, speak up. Don't wait till the end. I mean, it's, we always keep it very informal here. Uh, there's other resources like Nemesis or something like that. Be sure, <laughs> sure to mention it. And hopefully. Oh, sure. If I have trouble seeing it, I know Sam's got True. Uh, hopefully it'll be interactive and productive. No promises. You'll get your money back if it's not. So um, one of the ones we'll start, let's, let's start by just building a unikernel, probably the simplest way to start with this. Uh, we're going to use something called, there's a company called OpsCity, and we'll use their product for it since it's really pretty easy to use. It's about as easy as anything can be. So like everything today, it's a curl. You just pipe through an SH. So what could go wrong with that? Deployment and stuff like that. You just have your application is all you care about. You don't care about anything around it, so you just build it every time and deploy it. So it's the latest and greatest version. So it's got some interesting benefits. Also, it's got some uh, potential in uh, scientific computing because you can uh, theoretically just, uh, I just want this, uh, F this FFT to happen as quickly as possible. I just link everything into that. I'm not doing anything else in terms of using any external resources. I'm not doing any context switching. I'm not doing any address protection. I'm not doing anything. It just runs that one thing as quickly as I can. So it's like example, I mean, if you take uh, uh, something compiled with, uh, with a 64-bit OS, single address space versus a, like um, like BIOS can beat, uh, not, not not BIOS. Um, IQ can beat Linux in certain things because of the, the way that they're laid out in terms of their design and stuff like that. And there's some places where a unikernel can be substantially faster. So it's it's something to do with whole it's experimentation. It, it's interesting now with uh, Docker and stuff like that and Kubernetes and stuff. People are starting to evaluate it for it. and the cloud, of course. Let's go ahead and install that bad boy. Come on, resize. I did not want to resize that one. I want to resize the one inside. And can you run them not in a VM, but kind of like as a VM on a regular OS? Yes. That's how we're going to do it here. A, oh, okay. Yeah. That's how you do it when you're doing testing. You can deploy it either uh, to real bare metal, or you can deploy it on top of like Zen or KVM, QEMU, that kind of stuff. It, it's got a, quite a few options for it. So let's. Give it a shot. 
and I don't have curl installed. So I installed everything else in the world except I can't believe Debian doesn't super curl now. You know, I saw QEMU, Go, a bunch of other stuff last night to get everyone ready to go. But no, it does offer a great deal. It's, it's, it, it's, I don't know if it's, I don't consider it ready for production. Some people do. There's some references we'll be talking about a little later on. There's some people who are, think unikernels are the next thing, and there's people who think unikernels are the devil. That's an interesting, uh, let's do curl again. The devil is the next. Oh, let's go. Come on, OPS. <coughs> it's ran much faster. <laughs> the girl from Ipanema? Yeah. Really? All right. All right. So, Ops is a company that uh, releases something called Nano VMS. Nano VMs. Which they have their stuff for the reason we'll lay it out for and we'll show you in a minute here. And it just pulls it all down. They uh, sell support and service on top of theirs. There's a lot of questions about that uh, nano in general. Um, okay. Oh. <laughs> Make sure we got. So we should have ops installed. So we have ops installed now. If you see, let me control plus plus that a few dozen times. So ops uh, has the following commands. Build an image from an elf. Uh, help by the, uh, elf is a regular POSIX executable. Uh, help, help by the command, manage and handle instances. Uh, one thing it has that's really cool is the ability to deploy to the Google Cloud Platform. But now we have Ops installed. So that's how long it took. So we'll give you an idea about it. Come on. So we need an application now. So we'll create an echo server in the Go programming language. Everybody knows what echo server is. You can tell that to it, it just gives you back the output. Uh, input is output. Nothing too bad. We'll use the one from rosettacode.org. If you don't know what rosettacode.org is, it's a site that has a bunch of example programs in a, a variety of different languages. It's like Hello World, Echo Servers, uh, a bunch of various little program stuff. I've just written about every knowable, every language that's out there that has any popularity behind it. It give you a really kind of good thing if you're trying to, you have to learn something in a new language. And you want to see how Lua compares to Node or something like that. They just have basic stuff. So. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to compile the program locally. So So we're not using a nano kernel all right now. We're just building the actual echo program. And we take a look at the program, or OG, as they should call it. They should support both. But I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Format, net, buff.io, from echo, da 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 da. And it just lists as a port 8080. So we have it compiled. <clears throat> we'll fire it up, and we'll go over to another window. We'll control plus plus that. Telnet, local host, 8080. Type some stuff, Caesar's connection, sends the data back to us. This has done absolutely nothing with a unikernel yet, but the reason why we're doing this is because it gives us the program we're going to turn into a unikernel. So we just verified it's up and running. It was up and running. We've taken it down since then. So let's go ahead. Oops. Let me go back 
right slash overlay. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to set it up to run. Uh, the command is ops run dash p8080 dash c config js, which is a simple JavaScript program which I look at, and the echo executable. What it'll do is create an image in the ops image uh, folder named echo. It fires the QEMU, which is just a virtualization layer, and it starts an image with config js and the echo programs. So let's go ahead and build it real quick. That's a nice resource. So let's take a quick peek at the config.js. So for the config.js, there's uh, the support files is the uh, <coughs> uh, live in a DNS file and the certificates file. It needs those. Don't know exactly why, but I know it will not run without those. So we give it what it wants, or else it's not happy. So, it's downloading it, <coughs> it's building an image, it's booting an image, it is signing an IP address to that image. Uh, since we gave it the dash P8080, it's going to uh, proxy that from the local host to that virtual machine. It's using uh, the bridge mode version of uh, QEMU, which you normally want to do if you're talking about high performance type stuff, but for the most part it works pretty well. And the reason why I'm talking like now is because I'm giving it a minute to boot. This is the first time it's building it. It could be quite quick or it could be quite slow. I'm betting money on it's going to take a couple seconds, so let's give it a shot. <laughs> Telnet, localhost, 8080. All right, so we have a connection. Oops, let me pop over here real quick. From our machine to the uh, uh, machine, the Docker, the instance running inside the Op City uh, uh, Unikernel. So now, if we go ahead and type something, it gets us our data. So now we have built a kernel. So that's interesting in its own right. But by the way, let's double check, make sure we actually are running a kernel. And that is what it's running behind the scenes. QEM system, x86-64, drive, the file is home, ops, image, echo.image, so it creates an image file, which is a self-contained operating system with everything it needs to be able to run itself. Um, da -da -da -da. What else we got that is interesting? Yeah, just the host forwarding uh, TCP IP port 8080-8080, and uh, this lays out the basics of the max memory is 2 gig, which it's not going to approach. If you're running a larger program and you actually do bump against that and you don't have that much memory allocated in your real machine, <laughs> but, uh, that's a whole other thing. So it gives you an idea of what it can do. So it does actually, so we built a unikernel. We now have a unikernel as box. And if we head over to that OPS, we go into images, there is a complete and total operating system in there. And the size of that system is 9.8 meg for everything. That is more than it actually needs. You can still strip stuff out of it. I've gone pretty easy with this components and stuff. You can do other components with it. But let's go ahead and shut that down now. Let's take a look at some of the options. But. Of course you can do this. I just get that in the wrong order. But it gives you a whole bunch of different options for what you can and can't do with it. One thing that's really cool about it is it has a target cloud string. So you can actually say where you want to deploy it. So you can actually have it, as part of building the image, have it deployed to the Google Cloud. If you give it all the credentials, all that information. I've not played with that component of it yet. But if you actually know what you're doing, which I don't in that part, you can deploy it directly from there. Come on. Come on back. So. That proves, well, that, that proves is a hard, strong word, but I think it gives us idea we can. Let's come back to that. So, oh yeah, one thing I didn't show is, um, if we take a look at that image. It is a boot sector raw image. So, 
It is, it is theoretically, you can pick this up and run this any place else you want to. I was going to ask if you could run this on a Windows environment. If you have a virtualization thing, you can. You can. I mean, if you want to, you can drop it on a uh, USB stick and actually put it. What? No. Well, floppy's going away. It's got deprecated. I, I, it's, it's the wonders of life. There's no limits. We're in a limitless world. This looks pretty interesting. What if, um, I mean, and I don't know if it would work for this, but the things that cause security issues like for viruses, like a browser or maybe email. Files. We'll talk about that a bit more later. I like a browser, for instance. Yeah, there, there, there's some ups and some downs with it. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. There's some people who think, I mean, we're back to the thing that's pros and cons. Some people think this is the next step, next evolution. Other people are thinking this is just a total dead end. Because there's things in here that uh, you assume that you get a normal um, operating system like uh, rings and stuff like that. This doesn't run, run at ring three. This all runs at ring zero. This everything runs privileged. There's no I hack the executable. Well, you have to then jump to root privileges. No, you are rooks. You have full privileges of everything. There's nothing to stop you from doing anything. There's no protection. There's no app armor. There's no SE Linux. Which, now let's face it, is that a bad thing? <laughs> But so we have it. So let so now that we've got it, let's take a look and see if we can actually run the bad boy outside it. So for this one, we'll just cut and paste the instructions we had. So what I'm going to do here is just for funsies. Yes. What am I? Oh. And the funny thing about this is, how this command, I spent like 25 minutes trying to figure out how to reverse engineer this, and then I just eventually ran PS while Ops was running the executable. That took care of it. So this will run it without being inside ops at all. This is independent of it. We're just running that executable oh. using the QEMU stuff. Just want to verify that works. And it should. So we now have executable theoretically. You can pick up and drop about anywhere you want to. executable with this, with the ops stuff, you can do anything. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. There's, there's some there's some caveats with ops, which, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we've done, we compiled the Go program to executable. Uh, we created a, created a simple config JSON file and created an ops image. And we've run the ops image both inside and outside the ops environment. So that's what we've done so far. So we've created a unikernel successfully. We have it only exists to run one program. That's the tel that's that echo program from Go. Theoretically, you can run about any Go program without much issue, depending upon what you have to deploy in there. You may have to include additional files and stuff like that. If you have like the OLUG website, you'd want to have uh, all the static pages and all that information included inside that as well. Because if not, it won't get bundled into the package. So you have to lay it all out. But it's all laid out in their documentation, and they do a really good job with that. Um, they have a lot of additional capabilities. Oh yeah, let's uh, pop out that. Ops package list real quick. Okay. All right. Oh, because you are a later one. And one thing to keep in mind is it updates everything dynamically. So if you have old Windows open that before you installed it, which idea. So this gives you an idea of what it supports in terms of languages and systems. Uh, PHP, Ruby, Nginx, you can, 
have everything laid out there, what, it, what the packages understands natively are. So you can, Nginx, if you want to take a website, you can put it in there. Um, Memcached, which actually, the, so they've done some weird uh, experiments with Memcached in terms of performance and stuff, and the numbers they got back were just nutty. I mean, they got, kind of, I mean, really fast numbers, kind of numbers you're like, I don't think that's right. But uh, R, Ruby, Lua, PHP, Hiawatha, G4, because you know G4 is coming back. Um, Node, everybody loves Node. Python, 2.7. Yeah. Uh, Java, Mosquito, a bunch of other stuff like that. So it gives you an idea of some of the packages to understand. It can actually build those into it and stuff. So, yeah, we'll talk about that. In a second. Why do you keep going back to this one? Oh, because that's where I have pointed to that one. Um, Uh, which one did I miss? No, I think I got all this. Um, Obsidian can do things like we talked a little bit about automatically deploy the Google Cloud platform, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it has instructions for doing deploying to other clouds like DigitalOcean and stuff as well. They got a lot of information on their website. Uh, language support stability. Uh, right now, Opsity works pretty well with Golang, PHP, Node.js, and Ruby. Uh, my second experiment was with Java. And it did not go well, let's just put it that way. Uh, started with the Echo server, worked my way down to Hello World, and just kept going smaller and simpler and simpler and simpler, and I never had success with it. Uh, tried various options, grabbed their nightly builds, all that kind of stuff, I just couldn't get it to go. Uh, looked at their forums and stuff, didn't have much luck, so I would not say this is Java ready, let's put it that way, but it's, it's interesting. Maybe Python ready? It seemed pretty good with Python. I didn't try much with it. I just did a little world with it, but it seemed to understand that. And once, I mean, once you understand the core of C Python, it will probably go pretty well. So if you put Django in there, I think you might have different results. But uh, anything simpler and stuff like that. Keep in mind, you're doing this whole thing where it's got to figure out what it needs to include and stuff. And all depends on how you. I, I very easily could have been me. I just got the config JS wrong, and there's something I'm not including in, and it's not smart enough to figure it out to tell me what I'm missing. So. Um, Let's talk a little about some types of uh, unikernels. Uh, there's generic unikernels. These are able to run general programs. Uh, it can be run in many different locations. Other examples include Rump Run. Rump Run is a, a NetBSD project. What they do is uh, they take an executable and uh, they take an, uh, oh, they create a custom OS and they just rip everything out that's not needed. Uh, Rump Run is based upon apparently during uh, England during one of their civil wars when the royalty got thrown out. They call it the Rump Run when they got rid of all the royalty. And stuff. So it's supposed to be uh, pretty successful, but it's got some issues we'll talk about as well. Um, language specific unikernels, uh, these are designed to support one specific language runtime. An example of this is Clive for the Go programming language. Uh, it's kind of a glorified read evaluation print loop, which uh, everybody's dealt with, that hopefully. Uh, <clears throat> the benefit of this is they know the language, they're not supporting everything. They just have to support the standard library and stuff like that on it. The drawback is you have to have everything in that language. I started playing with Clive a little bit and it seemed to be pretty good, but it's not in a real commercial state yet and stuff like that. But if you're thinking in terms of languages, what you're deploying and all that kind of stuff in there, that's a really kind of cool way to do it because it knows a lot more about the language. It doesn't have to understand the whole OS. It's not creating a whole, taking the whole OS and just starting to rip parts out of it. You're taking the base language and just putting alternative options in throughout. Um, reduce OSs. Uh, an example of this is Hermitux, which is, uh, this sounds pretty cool, but I did not look into a whole lot. Uh, this is able to run ex uh, Linux executables with a reduced OS size. What they did was they took the OS and they said, like, you don't need this, you don't need this, you don't need this, and they still run it in kind of the same way. So it's just a really cut down version of Linux kernel, which is kind of cool. You think if you went through and you um, did a make config, took all, all the software you, you don't need, all the modules you don't need, all that components, you would get some performance improvements there as well. That's kind of what it seems to be doing. There's a lot of other types included as well. People are making their own unikernels that are, some are really well defined, some are just some guy who had an idea in the afternoon was apparently just taking peyote. So, <laughs> um, talk a little about some of those. Uh, Clive is not a system go language we've talked about. Uh, Click OS is supposed to be very fast, through 20 milliseconds, minimal Zen OS. A uh, HAL VM is a Haskell compiler tool suite, because everybody loves Haskell. Uh, uh, include OS, library used to generate OS images, designed to run C++ code. 
What you do there is you use their C++ code, you link in the libraries, you generate things people through a cross-compiling uh, GCC thing. Uh, Rump front, an FBSD system we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, Unik, a system that's similar to Docker to build unikernels. Hermitux, which is also the one we talked about earlier, which is kind of cool. There's the one I sent out about a week ago to the website, uh, a link to this other one called UKL, uh, Unikernel Linux. It's a recent paper was published proposing a set of extensions for the Linux kernel to generate unikernels. The interesting part of this is the approach they plan on is uh, taking as would it the simple build Linux kernel uh, with the UKL option to generate self-contained bootable executable. Uh, has anybody ever played with user mode Linux? All right. User mode Linux. You take the Linux kernel, you turn it into a executable. You can run the user mode Linux on top of Linux. It is tremendously useful if you're debugging kernel features. Because you can actually use GDB. You can do all that stuff locally. You don't have to use GDB through a remote serial console and stuff like that. Uh, user mode Linux has been around for a number of years. It can do all sorts of wonderful things. But they're taught, the way when you build the, uh, you make a kernel for uh, uh, UML, it's make kernel uh, uh, mode equals uh, UML and stuff like that. It's pretty straight, pretty easy to do. I've done it in quite some time. But these guys are talking about trying to do the same thing for UKL. They want to just turn a unikernel Linux version into just one more build option. So it's not an extension. It's not some separate project. It's part of the Linux kernel. They're hoping to actually be able to get it included inside that. Uh, it's Still very early days. What it does, it does an inspection of your executable and figure out what you need to pull in, what you don't need to pull in, and it generates one executable again. But it uh, uses a lot of stuff from other people. They're actually going to, I feel pretty strong. This one's got actually some legs because they actually have, um, their approach is really good because they've gotten some sign off from some people on the kernel mailing list on parts of it and stuff like that. And if it does come down to being simple as a cross compilation kind of thing, that would be very cool because that becomes the default. And that becomes just another option. And then it gets it's once it's in the baseline kernel, we all know it gets tested by more people, gets evaluated, more people gets played with by more people. So if that one takes off, that one could be very interesting. Or the guys could decide it's not worth it. But I'm kind of curious to see how that evolves. Uh, some of the benefits of the kernel. Less code. You're, you're not running everything, let's let's be honest. A smaller environment. We saw a 10 meg for the Echo program. We could cut it down more if we were going to spend some more time with it. Uh, works well in the DevOps type environment because you're just building a new executable every time you're deploying it. Throw away the old one, just keep it going. Uh, reduce the attack surface. You don't have Telnet running. You don't have SSH running. You don't have any of that stuff running unless you explicitly include it. You have no open ports in that box here. The only port open in uh, the uh, ops environment we created was 88. Other than that, everything else is closed. There's nothing else you can do with it. There's no user accounts. There's no user IDs. There's no anything. It's pretty much as simple, straightforward. Which raises the question, is it better security? Uh, some of the drawbacks of uh, unikernels. Uh, article by Brian Cantrell. Uh, unikernels are unfit for production. It is pretty rough. Uh, he, he doesn't like them. But it comes down to how do you debug a, a unikernel? Are you back to putting printouts and stuff throughout the system and just trying to figure out what it's doing? How do you do this component and all that kind of stuff. So that does that is a true that is an issue that's being dealt with. Uh, limitations of a program: no memory swapping, no processes. You can't do coroutines. You can't do this kind of stuff. It just does one thing. It falls to the wall, for lack of a better term. Uh, it can be tough to do complicated programs. It's, if you want to do MySQL and work, you want a WordPress site with MySQL and this and this. How does this all run together? Some of the kernels, some of the unit kernels can handle it. Some can't. A lot of the ones I've looked at just is like one thing. You have one executable, that's all it runs. So you're, you're kind of screwed there. Uh, you could do a SQLite, obviously, because that can be linked into a program, but how you do it otherwise, it's not laid well laid out. Uh, still early days. Uh, example given, Rump Run has been unsupported for quite some time. Some new group is like picking it up, but it was out of support for quite a while and it was still being used by a lot of people playing experimentation with it. Um, once a unikernel is compromised, the attacker has full privacy of the environment. There's no restrictions. You are, if you can figure out what components are there, you can do whatever you want to on that anymore. There's no restrictions. There's nothing that's going to stop you. There's no file permissions. There's no nothing. You can get whatever privileges you want to. If, you, if there's enough of the networking code linked into it, you can theoretically use that to hop to another box from there and so on and so forth. Because think about it, if you're talking like Go, you've got a pretty complete uh, .NET runtime. I mean, uh, uh, Network run, I know, network uh, stack in there to be able to get stuff, get out of it and stuff. So, 
there's a lot of it. Uh, no concept of user IDs, user permissions, memory checks, and so on. Things you normally think of, like, um, which we'll talk about in the next, yeah. Um, it gets complicated. So a little more about security unit kernels, complicated. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. There is a, a really good paper by a group, uh, by the NCC group, titled Assessing Unit Kernel Security. Uh, some security features aren't addressed in some unit kernels. Let's say most, or probably. Uh, address space, space layout randomization. Every time it runs, it's going to be laying out memory structures in the same order, same number of bytes, all that kind of stuff, which is something that we quit doing years ago. For like Windows, quit doing it 18 years ago, and, and Linux has been even longer. It's quit doing it. Uh, uh, WX, no, NX protection is not enabled. So everything, all memory is writable. There's no protections against that. Um, these guys also wrote, in part of their paper, they wrote example programs showing how each one worked, which is actually, it's a really great paper. If you want to see a good security paper, they, they did it because they had like little tiny programs. They linked it in there, they showed how it just beat it. And they, they know the address every time, how they could actually beat around that. So the CEO's of City had a blog post rebutting uh, most of the findings of the paper. It was interesting because he didn't rebut their assertions because they said uh, it doesn't do AS, uh, he would actually took their code and ran it. And he has the same problems. But he's saying it doesn't apply to, apply to that because they're not designed to be that way. They're designed to be a, a custom application type stuff. And it, one of the reasons why they're faster is because they don't have that overhead. They don't have the limitation. So he did a decent job rebutting it. But I mean, it's still. Uh, he also said it was early days. This <laughs> just comes back to what, how it works. Um, some of the issues are less dangerous uh, when running on a VM, since you're running in ring three, than running on real hardware, you're running in ring zero. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Would I deploy anything really important on a Unicron right now? I would consider it, but I would not have it be running on a, a system that had other valuable stuff on it. It would be segmented off into its own place. It would be like its own part of the compute lab or its own part of the world or something like that. It would not be something that would have real connectivity options back to everything else. It would be remarkably tied down. But I think performance benefits are very interesting to be figured out. <laughs> Because uh, one of the examples being um, a company I know in town does these uh, builds of these huge databases every week. And if they could speed that up 10, 20% by doing unikernels, they'd be incredibly interested in that. And if they could actually achieve that, that the benefits, costs, and stuff like that could definitely work out for them. But they'd want to have that be locked down to the point where that only runs that one component on that one machine. You're back to like a single process, single thread kind of thing. You're back to MS-DOS is what it comes back to. So. A uh, little about the history of unikernels. I should have put this slide earlier, but I didn't. Uh, unikernels go back to the 90s and have been around in various forms since then. Uh, the rise of DevOps, uni uh, with the rise of containers DevOps, unikernels are being reevaluated. Re uh, some people say the fourth is the original unikernel. Uh, goes still being used by NASA. It's still, that's, uh, fourth goes back to the 60s, by the way. It was written uh, originally controlled radio telescopes. It is a remarkably interesting language it's because it is all based on our first Polish notation, stack-based. It is uh, it is the trippiest language, pretty much. It's one of my favorites as well, but I don't do enough in it. But um, the idea behind this is you wrote the words, you extended the language over time and stuff like that. But it, it comes back to it. If you look at like um, MicroPython, CircuitPython that runs on the ESP8266 or Raspberry Pi, however you want to run it, that is a unikernel. That is running one language in a read evaluate print loop. That's how it works. That's what it's designed to do. So we're seeing a lot of that stuff kind of coming back with Internet of Things. Uh, the future unikernels, <laughs> this is a standard. I should put this in every talk. There will be some consolidation in this area and more startups being founded and more companies closing, more companies getting bought by various other companies and so on and so forth. Um, Internet of Things offers some potential new places for the deployment of unikernels. Think about it, if you have a light bulb, you create a unikernel, it only has like three options in it, is that really nice? That could be, because all it can do is go out and talk to that. The problem then becomes down to, how do you reflash the light bulb? Uh, do you put a, a, another OS on top of it that can handle the ability to go out, down, go out and grab a new version of the uh, OS, the unikernel and download it, reinstall it? How do you handle that component? Or is it just throw away, it's a light bulb, it's $2, buy a new one, you cheap uh, guy. So, 
It's interesting stuff. Um, when a large company announces a project using a unikernel, it will be interesting. I haven't seen anybody officially announce it yet. It would be interesting to see if Cray or somebody like that were to actually do something like that, just in terms of uh, trying to figure out to get more performance out of a, a real computer and stuff like that. Um, Kubernetes plus unikernels might be very interesting. Uh, if you play with Kubernetes at all, it is uh, it is really cool. Every Chick Fil A in the U.S. that has three machines and it running Kubernetes nowadays. Kubernetes is a, a system where you take uh, well, I don't do a Kubernetes talk sometime. Uh, you take multiple machines, any a cluster of machines, and you just unleash applications onto it, and it handles the care and feeding of it. You say, I need this web server to stay up. It's like. Well, it died on this machine. I'll start it over here, and we'll just keep it running and stuff. That handles networking stuff all behind the scenes. It's phenomenally nice. Uh, Kubernetes is so simple that the Chick-fil-A guys think that their uh, manager are actually going to handle the uh, maintenance of it. So, <laughs> but uh, Kubernetes deserves its own talk sometime. But uh, it's it's a very cool thing. It, it, it's the next thing after Docker, pretty much. But it's going to just turn out to be a big thing. So, that kind of gives you an idea what we're talking about. And uh, just ran through a couple simple examples, nothing too exciting on it. So that's what I got. Does anybody have any questions? Any thoughts? Yes? So trying to understand this, uh, what comes to mind has is Lambda, and that's the AWS Lambda. Mm -hmm. That's on Lambda. Yeah. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, definitely you could do something with that. I mean, if you're going to have persistent Lambdas, it was going to be, it'd be very cool to build one, build yeah. one in small images. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's really done any research on that really yet. Uh, Lambda, if you don't know, is you take a function, and you don't care how it's run, you just l load it into uh, uh, it, it, Amazon's AWS, an AWS environment, and it handles the provisioning, firing up, uh, marshaling of resources, input output and just shuts it down afterwards. You don't actually deploy the application to the server. It handles it behind the scenes for you. Uh, if you do any Amazon Echo programming, uh, you normally do Lambda. It's usually probably the easiest way to do it. And speaking of, if you're interested in knowing more about that, I'll be talking to the Heartland Developers Conference in about a month about it. Amazon AWS and uh, writing Echo apps. And this summer it's come on pretty good. But uh, yeah, no, Lambda has tremendous potential if you can actually do that. or. Uh, if you look at Kubeless and stuff like that, I don't know if anyone's done any real research in that, but a lot of Lambdas, the idea is they don't hang around, I mean, they don't, obviously don't hang around for very long, but if you could have that situation where it actually had an OS and had just enough to run it, it'd be cool. Yeah, so this is the yeah. 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 Well, there's a, there's a company, I can't remember the name of it, that does mind mapping software. They, they went through, they replaced their whole infrastructure with AWS Lambda. And if they, could actually, they run the same 100 every thousands and thousands of times a day. If they can have those already pre-ready pre to go, that could save them some time and money. Yeah, definitely. So, interesting. Any other question? It actually sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm sitting makes it a lot of music. Play with, yeah. So, um, you, you were mentioned in um, configuring, for instance, what packages you put in there. I saw yeah. you, you specified Echo, but it sounded like there's a lot more specific provisioning you can do. You should read doc the documentation off city. What I added, what I was doing with mine, uh, let's actually go take a look at this. There's the straight config.js for the Echo program, mm -hmm. which is really just simple, and there's the one I did for the Oh, that's actually a simple one as well. That's probably why it didn't work. <laughs> um, that's the one for the Java program, where you sell the class and the arguments and stuff like that. But you have to figure out what files it's going to need. You have to include them inside there, and there's a whole bunch of other options in there. Well, the way it works out, you normally, uh, what you do is you can put the file program, do an LDD against the ex executable. So yeah. if we do LDD against uh, Echo here, it'll tell us what it needs. Yeah, because this was kind of like... <clears throat> What you had to do when you were playing with gels at first. Yeah, you yeah, had to exactly. Out exactly what what libraries um, somebody yeah. needed, et cetera, et cetera. It, That is a perfect analogy. Is how the old jails and stuff like that works and stuff like that. You have to you have to you're putting everything back together in a container and just yeah. when you're just building into a static and something after that. But it is a bit hit or miss. The documentation on the on the Op City site I recommend it highly. They 
There's one of the better ones. I want to really see how that evolves. Uh, Clive is done by this company that seems, I, I, I don't have a whole lot of documentation behind it, but if you go out to uh, uh, GitHub, there's a thousand different unit kernels out there that are in various states. Obsidy, I went with them because they seem to have, the, have their stuff together pretty well. And they seem to be pretty user friendly, pretty beginner friendly, which is what I was looking for, obviously. But yeah, no, but it is a hit or miss process. And the great thing about it is, like that one paper talk about the debugging process, is a big old middle finger if you're lucky. Because <laughs> what I got back from the Java during during my experiments with that were just uh, just drove me up the wall. Because it seemed like it would work for a split second, then it just like threw me thousands of lines of output. I just like, what am I doing wrong? So I mean that that, that part's got to be more defined. If there was a Java uh, unit kernel that was designed just to support Java that had a better understanding of the <coughs> Java class structure and stuff, I think that might work really well for it. So what you're saying is it runs so fast that if it errors, you get a lot of error, but just real fast. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> yeah no, it, it, it's like, yeah, it's a car that goes 100 miles an hour with no brakes. But, it, but it's interesting while it's running. But I mean, the, the, the core of it was, I was thinking, actually thinking about uh, possibly uh, one of the groups in town, I, I work with a security group, I was thinking about actually taking this and like taking our website and just compiling it up into this and just running the website on a, on a container so it wouldn't be able to be hacked at all. And if something did happen to it, just kick it over and restart it again. That's kind of what, what I was thinking, you know, with the browser yeah. and server things, right? And if you kick off that process with a low-level user yeah. ID, even this hardware that is yeah. or whatever. Yeah, but I mean, if you think about it, if you had something along the lines of, if you could get enough of the browser working in like a kiosk type environment or something like that, you just, it, it, it hung up, click, well, restart it, it'll take care of itself. That's why the reason Internet of Things, like things like light bulbs, stuff like that, it can actually just start it over again. You don't care what yeah. happened to it. It's, it tends to be a little more robust because you don't really care about the file system at all. It's not going to be doing an FSCK for 45 minutes, Tom, yeah. But, but like, um, <clears throat> putting a website on there, even if it's a simple one, yeah. how do you specify your website? Within the configuration files, or yeah, you'd have to have the nginx configuration file in there. Yeah. You, you deploy is not. Uh, you'd use the ops package list from uh, nginx for for from uh, ops city, and you would actually uh, just put the configuration in there. You have to put the files all in, in the config JSON file, mm -hmm. so you'd have to have all of them in there. But the other thing is, keep in mind, you lose all logging, all that kind of stuff. Also goes away as well because it's just like a, a pretty much a read only type of thing. Yeah. Now you have an application that. <clears throat> I've always been, been worried about if I compile it, that it can be reverse engineered. Yeah. That's the word I'm looking yeah. for. I imagine this would make it much tougher. Or not. I don't, well, no, well, you still have an executable. You can still go through it. I mean, you're able to figure out, you're able to recognize parts of it. Yeah, but, yeah. but, but instead of, of your yeah. 5,000 line Python code, yeah. it's a whole kernel. And yeah, it would probably be much harder to reverse engineer. You still have an entry point to it. So I think for the language ones, still you're going to build. I don't. I haven't really put that kind of obfuscation in there, but you could. I mean, there's nothing to stop from that. But, but, but yeah. So that's what I got. Any other questions? Right. And everybody should have access to the slides. Throw them out to the list the other yep. night. So thanks everybody for watching. If you watched, where are the slides? Are on Nola? They're on the mailing list. Yes. Yep. And um, remember, September we need presenters. Put them in badly. Yellow wizard needs food badly. Blue wizard needs presenters. So thanks for watching. We're going to end the stream here. Three, two.